of which have uh, significant implications for, for states. And although we're kind of at the point where we're getting fatigued with it and uh, where state interest is kind of where the public interest is, uh, we still have to digest all of this. And, and that's what we're going to try to do here today. And I'm very I'm fortunate to be joined by two great professionals uh, who dig into the, the weeds on the state-federal fiscal relationship in a far more uh, cogent way than, than we do here. And uh, they are uh, uh, Michael Leachman, who's pinch hitting for Sharon, uh, for Sharon from the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities. Um, Michael is Director of State Fiscal Research for the, state, for, um, for the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities. Uh, and also Tad DeHaven, a budget analyst for, uh, for the uh, Cato Institute. Um, and before we, we kick it over to the two of them, um, I do want to just make a couple of, um, of kind of scene-setting observations. And, and those are just to, to kind of get to the bottom of where we are in all of this, this kind of set of deadlines hitting us and us reacting to them and figuring out how, how they ultimately play out in state general fund balances. We kind of have to go to the beginning. And really, for us, it's the Budget Control Act that came in the summer of 2011 when we were uh, in the first fight over debt ceiling increases and uh, the credit rating of the United States was being downgraded. That's really ultimately set the context in which all of these other fiscal deadlines have played out, such as the failure of the Super Committee, which uh, it basically stopped working at the end of November of 2011, formally dissolved in 2012 its effort to create some sort of grand solution that might include revenue, that might include mandatory spending cuts, uh, that all went out the door. Then we had an election. After the election, we had our, our kind of New Year's Eve deadline on the fiscal cliff that we had talked about in our last webinar, uh, and basically got a tax compromise that, uh, uh, that extended some, uh, some of the Bush cut cuts for, for the majority of the population. But, added some new revenue by increasing rates for the top earners, and also kicked up the, the deadline for the sequestration trigger down the road by a couple of months, which leads to where we are now. And finally, kind of the continuing resolution deadline, the next thing that we're talking about here on, on Capitol Hill, which is just keeping the federal government open and the lights on, uh, and that deadline coming on March 27th. But the bottom line is all of those deadlines kind of play out in state budgets by their impact on federal discretionary spending, which is that uh, essentially $1 trillion of a $3.5 trillion federal budget. And if we go back to that first deadline, to the Budget Control Act of 2011, back in the summer of 2011, this is what the federal spending trajectory for that $1 trillion of that $3.5 trillion total federal budget looked like. Um, we were set to go across a curve that looked like that going into the future. That was the CBO baseline. And then we enacted $900 billion in actual cuts through the Budget Control Act in the first tranche. And it kind of shaved off a little bit of, of actual spending in the first year or so, and mainly kind of made the curve a little gradual. And the assumption was that we were going to do something through the super committee or do something through legislative action that was going to change this further. Uh, but the sequestration was really designed to be, uh, you know, just that kind of fail-safe maneuver that nobody wanted. And that's what that curve did. It dropped uh, discretionary spending dramatically in the fiscal year we're in, 2013, and kept it below the trend line really for five years into the future. Uh, so when we talk about, about the cuts that have been, in, uh, been triggered, uh, certainly, it's true to say that they are a drop in the bucket when it comes to the total federal spending picture. But when we talk about that trillion dollars of federal discretionary spending, which covers everything from teachers to tanks, you know, on the non-defense discretionary side and the defense side, it is a dramatic change. Um, and how that plays out for everybody on this line is this. This is your number based on the analyses done both in January and then last month by Federal Funds Information for States. If you find your state and look at the left-hand column, the one that says grants, what that is is the total effect of the sequester, keeping in mind that it was delayed by two months, on 42 major program accounts affecting the state-federal funding relationship. The biggest of those would be Title I education and, um, and special education. Uh, but extending down to the state energy program and lots of different other things. 
Uh, and you'll see that the number on that side, which is expressed in millions, is it a significant number. You know, certainly if you're the state of California and you're going to uh, um, lose grant funding of, you know, on order of $600 million, that's, that's a big number. Uh, but because it's spread out over all of those accounts, and it's often funding things that are exclusively federally funded, you might have um, employees in that state energy program office that are on 100% federal funding. So in some ways, you, the expectation is that most state, uh, states will pass on those, uh, uh, those reductions to the recipients as opposed to having to backfill them with state general fund dollars. It hasn't created a huge splash in terms of state outrage, uh, certainly not within the Council of State Governments. There's plenty of concern out there, not, not to minimize that. But really, it's that other column on the right which doesn't represent dollars flowing into state budgets, but it's just the economic impact of the defense reductions on state economies that to the extent that it has raised state attention, it's been in that column, which is a, a bit surprising. Uh, but it's been governors who are particularly uh, affected, like uh, in Virginia, where the number is, is truly compelling. You know, the state loses $100 million in non-defense grants revenue, but it stands to lose $3.3 billion in economic activity because of the defense cuts. But even in places like Hawaii, where you've got, uh, in essence, a 9 to 1 difference between what, uh, what the state loses in grant funding versus what the economic impact of the defense cuts are, it's kind of changed the tenor around the debate. And, and you have state budget offices that are more focused on kind of uh, modeling the economic impacts as opposed to thinking about uh, the impact of the flow of general fund or of federal funds um, dollars into the state and its effect on state general funds. So that's just kind of the scene setting. But we've got two people who have far more insights into this than I. Uh, and we're going to start off with Michael Leachman. Uh, one of the great things about these two organizations, or I, I'll say that I'll make two points of similarity between them and one point of difference. One of the great things about both of these organizations are that they are deeply committed to the states. Uh, in DC, we have tons of think tanks. Very few of them focus on state level um, policy and program activity, even though states in the last year passed almost 30,000 laws and resolutions. And the last Congress here, uh, the one that went out in 2012, passed a total of 219 bills and resolutions over a two year period. So there's actually far more policy activity and experimentation going on at the state level than we can muster at the federal level, but you don't have a lot of organizations who focus on them. CBPP and Cato are both exceptions to that rule. And both Michael and Tad are folks who've cut their teeth working at that state level as well as working up here up on the federal level. Another uh, point of commonality is they're, they're nonpartisan organizations. I, uh, that I've been out in state capitals and heard uh, people on both sides of the spectrum quoting Cato figures on things like uh, the impact of No Child Left Behind on states. Meanwhile, CBPP was one of the great leading light organizations in terms of modeling the state-federal fiscal relationship and the state impact of things like the Recovery Act. Uh, and I've seen those figures quoted both on the right and on the left. So definitely nonpartisan in terms of they, they want to reach out to the states, but they have a fundamental point of difference, and that's their perspective on this thing we're talking about, the state-federal fiscal relationship. They come at it with a very specific organizational point of view, and it's great to have both of those points represented today. So with that, Michael, I, I think I'll turn it over to you. Heather, if you could just queue up his slides. Great. Thanks very much, Chris. I really appreciate the opportunity. I really appreciate the work that you all do in the Council of State Governments. Thank you all for being on the call and for your interest in this topic. It's very important. Um, you know, as Chris mentioned, I'm subbing at the last minute today for Sharon Parrott. Uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and it takes two of us to, to fill her shoes. I have uh, joined with me uh, David Lara, who is with our federal legislative team. And uh, he can help me answer some of the questions that uh, that you all will have uh, after our presentations. So I'm going to address three questions. First, are the cuts that states just took from sequestration just the first of many? 
what's my what's my sense of the prospect of Congress reaching a deal uh, this year or even into the future that would limit the impact of the cuts? And what are the prospects for significant reductions in Medicaid funding? I understand those are three things that you all are particularly interested in, and um, I'm sure we'll get into other aspects of this during the Q&A. Let's start first with, are the cuts that states just took from sequestration just the first of many? So sequestration primarily, though not entirely, affects the discretionary side of the federal budget. Some cuts are, are to entitlements, Medicare, federal unemployment insurance benefits, for example, get some cuts. But mainly, these are cuts to the discretionary part of the budget. Heather, I'll get to that slide in just a moment. Thank you. Um, some of, uh, so what's funded through the discretionary part of the budget? About half goes to defense, the other half to a wide range of non-defense programs. Now, some of your states are getting hit hard by the defense cuts. Cuts. Chris talked a little bit about that. But all of you are going to take a hit from cuts in non-defense programs. And that non-defense funding includes a lot of stuff that it, it doesn't flow through the state and local services, um, like the FBI, border enforcement, medical research, national parks, food safety, that sort of stuff. That accounts for about three-fourths of non-defense discretionary funding. But the other quarter of non-defense discretionary funding, or NDD funding, is that's covered under sequestration. About a quarter of that will impact you directly because it goes to states and localities to help you do a wide range of things. So then that's, Heather, that, that's the slide that just emphasizes that point in the first slide. Thank you. Now, how do you all use that funding? Well, about a third of it goes to about 36% goes to education programs, mainly funding for high poverty schools and to educate disabled children. And the rest is a broad mix. It includes funding for clean water projects and law enforcement, assistance for vulnerable people, such as the, the WIC program, which provides nutrition for newborns and young children and nutrition education for their mothers. And all that funding for states is being cut under sequestration by about 5% in the current fiscal, federal fiscal year, and the cuts are going to continue in future years. It's important to keep in mind that, that funding for non-defense, the, the, the NDD, non-defense discretionary part of the budget, has already been cut a lot to help restore, uh, to help resolve the federal deficit. Even without sequestration, the funding caps put in place by the 2011 Budget Control Act, they're going to require significant cuts in, in this part of the federal budget over the next decade, nearly $1 trillion worth. So let me show you what that looks like in percentage terms. Heather, if you could show the next slide, please. So without sequestration, even before sequestration, NDD non-defense discretionary part of the budget in 2013 be, would be 10 percent below 2010 after adjusting for inflation. And a cut in 2021 would be 15 percent. Sequestration makes these cuts deeper, not just in 2013, but for nine full years. With sequestration, funding in 2013 is 15 percent below 2010 level adjusted for inflation. And in 2021, the cut grows to 20 percent. Those are big cuts, and that'll hurt people in your state, and it'll shift costs to your budgets, in some cases directly, in other cases indirectly. Now, we don't know exactly how the cuts are going to play out after the current federal fiscal year. Federal appropriators will have, they'll have to abide by the sequestration funding caps, but they can decide who, what gets cut to meet the caps. So this year, they have to cut everything across the board, but in the future, they'll get to choose how to distribute the cuts. But that almost certainly makes states and localities even more vulnerable. Funding for you likely will get cut even deeper, because if you think about the federal programs that are also covered under sequestration, the FBI, Border Enforcement Medical Research, for example, it's more likely that Congress will protect those things and funding for the states. So your cuts likely will be even greater than what I've just been talking about. 
Now, what other cuts may occur depends on what happens in the federal deficit reduction debate. We could end up with a package that includes a lot more cuts to discretionary programs, so that would just add to the damage. The next chart shows what's, what's happening to non-defense discretionary funding over the next few years. Heather, if you could go ahead to that, please. Thank you. Um, the cuts that have already been imposed will take us to very low levels compared to the historical average going back 35 years. Sequestration makes that worse, and deep additional cuts would just add more. And just as an illustration, we included here the cuts to NDD programs under the Ryan budget that passed the House last year. Those cuts would take funding for NDD programs to less than half their historical levels. Okay, so what's our sense of, of Congress, the prospect of Congress reaching a deal that would limit the impact of the cuts? So the, the crystal ball here is very hazy. It's just really hard to know what's going to happen. At this point, we, we don't expect a deal, though, to replace the 2013 sequestration, at least as a freestanding bill anytime soon, and if at all. However, as the impacts of all the sequestration cuts become clearer, there may be renewed energy behind dealing with them. But increasingly, there's a view that rather than negotiating around the, the, the 2013 sequester cuts alone, members of Congress and the President may once again try to discuss a broader deal that achieves additional deficit reduction and could deal with all nine years of the sequestration cuts. Now let me say that the, the disagreement between the two parties has been framed as a disagreement about whether additional deficit reduction should be achieved through spending cuts alone or through a mix of spending and revenues. And that actually misses a critical point. If policymakers are willing to look at spending in both federal programs and, through the, and spending through the tax code, so-called tax expenditures, and make priority choices about both kinds of spending, then a deficit reduction deal can be had. We do think that there, there's members of both parties who want to see compromise and a larger deal that could get us past these budget crises. And that, that makes us hopeful that a deal can be reached, but I wouldn't bet the farm on it. And one final note before I move on to talk about uh, the prospects for uh, Medicaid cuts. I I'm sure you all know this, and, and, but, uh, but states as well as organizations that, that get federal grants and contracts are being notified right now on a, on a rolling basis by federal departments and agencies about the cuts uh, in funding and the impact uh, on federally provided services in local communities. Um, for example, Governors are being sent letters by each department, each federal department, explaining the cuts in funding um, that that the states will that their state will get, and uh, and the entities within the state will will receive, um, as well as as changes in, in federally provided services. And you know some of those letters have already gone out. Others are going to be sent over the coming week or two. And those letters, as well as guidance that federal agencies will be issuing about the implementation of sequestration cuts, will help you understand a bit better how the cuts will affect your state. So the prospects for cuts to Medicaid, states are understandably interested in this. And while we expect the House Budget Committee Chairman Paul Ryan's uh, budget to, again, uh, include converting Medicaid into a block grant, and instituting very large, deep cuts in, in federal Medicaid funding for states. The block grants strongly opposed in the Senate and by the administration, so there's, there's essentially no chance of a block grant. It's important to note that Medicaid is already efficient. It provides health care at significantly lower cost than private insurance and is also growing slower on a per beneficiary basis than private insurance. In fact, the, the Congressional Budget Office's baseline outside of the Medicaid expansion has declined by about $200 billion 
since August 2010, in large part because of a slowdown in health care costs for beneficiaries. That means that there's few, if any, savings that can be achieved at the federal level that don't involve cost shift to states that would have significant negative consequences for beneficiaries by reducing access to care. While the administration's previously supported Medicaid savings that shift costs to states as part of its deficit reduction plan, the administration no longer supports these proposals. And one key reason is that the president and the administration now recognize that shifting costs to the states would discourage them from taking up the Medicaid expansion. And, and it's critical that the federal government maintain its promise to fund nearly all the costs of the Medicaid expansion. Now, that's, that's not to say that Medicaid's out of the woods in deficit reduction. There will continue to be a push for fundamental restructuring like block grants and per, per capita caps and deep cuts that shift costs to states. But key players like the administration will be opposing those kinds of cuts. If, and and if, 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 if further deficit reduction, though, isn't, isn't a balanced approach that, uh, that is focused both on spending through the budget and through the tax code, then that's going to put greater pressure on, on Medicaid. And, and it's critical that, that states support that kind of more balanced approach to avoid those kinds of cost shifts and allow you all to successfully implement health reform. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, next up we have Tad DeHaven. And what's great about having Tad on the line is he's been in the trenches with this both for two of the biggest kind of budget leaders on the Hill, Senator Jeff Sessions and also Senator Tom Coburn. But, it, but he's also been in the trenches in a state capital as well. You were deputy director of the Indiana State Budget Office. So certainly you know it from the federal side and the state side. Uh, and I, I look forward to getting your reaction, Tad, in terms of is this a, is this a train wreck or just a bump in the road? What, what do you think? Well, there's no doubt that if anything is getting squeezed right now, it's discretionary spending. Either party uh, wants to touch entitlements. You're going to see some movement from Paul Ryan on that. But as Michael just said, with regard to Medicaid, it's not going to go anywhere so long as uh, the Democrats control the Senate and uh, uh, President Obama is still there. So uh, I don't see any reform to Medicaid on that ground. Uh, you know, we're looking at cuts after pretty sizable one up not just in spending, but what I call state dependency on the federal government. If you go back to 2000, um, the share of total state spending that came from the federal government was about 25%. Uh, at the height of so-called stimulus, it was 34%. And now naturally, uh, for 2012, it's looking to be about 31%. Uh, that's still heavy dependence. and as I've recently commented, state governors and uh, state politicians are a special interest, uh, just like any other out there. Uh, I worked for Governor Mitch Daniels. It was Governor Daniels' policy to grab as much federal uh, money as possible so that he wouldn't have to get his hands dirty asking his taxpayers to pay for stuff. Uh, and that's a, uh, a common situation throughout the country. So. Yeah, you, you've seen Republican governors in particular be a little bit more reserved with regard to sequestration, but I can assure you through the back channels uh, there's complaints and concerns about them getting squeezed because, again, uh, heaven forbid, they have to ask their citizens to pay for their own benefits. So um, one thing I would point out is that, uh, yeah, we have sequestration Yes, we have these budget caps. Yes, they extend for 10 years. Uh, Long-term budget forecast should be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is nothing has changed in Washington to limit its ability to spend money. Uh, therefore, just because you have these caps in place and they're not the first caps and they're not the last, all it takes in Washington uh, is an excuse. And that excuse can be natural disasters. 
another economic downturn uh, in the case of military spending, which often translates into domestic uh, spending, it can be another boogeyman overseas. And so uh, if you can get up tight and wound up and, and scared about what's going to happen 10 years from now, but the federal government remains completely unrestrained. The state uh, government is addicted to federal spending. I think you can make a case that state government has basically become an administrative outpost of the federal uh, government. And so while there's going to be some wailing and gnashing of teeth from special interests at the state level to benefit from the federal dollars to get run through uh, the washer, through the state, onto the locals, et cetera, et cetera, uh, I don't think it's going to be the end of the world. Do you think this is the new baseline for us in terms of discretionary spending and that uh, you know there's been a little bit of movement here in DC in terms of uh, kind of uh, protocol around the administration and Congress working better together the president went to dinner with a, with some Republican senators last night but really in terms of the continuing resolution proposal that's in the house to keep the federal government funded it's all anticipating that the sequestration cuts stay uh, hasn't you know we're kind of in that that normal standoff of one side of the aisle looking for revenue, the other side looking for mandatory spending, neither side being able to compel the other side to capitulate. So from your side, Tad, is, is this the baseline that we just live with going forward and, uh, and short of one of those kind of unexpected events that gives the federal government uh, an excuse to break its own cap, uh, we just look at this as the discretionary future? Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if what happened on March 1st does not hold, hold up. Uh, you have a lot of um, Republicans uh, who aren't happy about the uh, reductions in, in military spending. Uh, I find the argument persuasive that the president is content to allow sequestration to continue to try and uh, uh, engineer public anxiety, sort of like maximize the pain of these cuts uh, in order to enhance the prospects of the Democratic takeover of the uh, entire Congress in 2014. And again, I think there's pressure behind the scenes from the governors and state politicians, uh, the, the aforementioned Republican uh, military hawks, to, to do something here about uh, uh, trying to, um, you know, media or uh, ameliorate uh, some of these cuts or at least bring some flexibility and, and, and that flexibility I think it's it's interesting that uh, some of the GOP were willing to pass legislation giving the administration more flexibility on where to make the cuts in the administration said no dice and that's why I say that I find the arguments that uh, the administration is content to uh, continue with the claims of mass uh, uh, destruction and hysteria for political gain. Uh, I, I find that quite believable. Well, thank you for that. I, I, I'm going to get to some of the questions that were already emailed in in advance. And uh, one of them is that, you know, obviously CBPP and Cato have extremely different views on this whole state-federal relationship, one being Cato's uh, a position, which you just articulated, Tad, that there is far too much federal money going to, to the states, and it's created a sense of dependency in your, your words. And then from CBPP side, I think that you have done a great job of, of outlining how uh, this federal re funding relationship is instrumental in supporting a whole range of social services and other investments that have their own economic impact. Uh, so you have that kind of debate of how much money should be going from the, the feds to the states. And it's a debate that will continue um, indefinitely into the future. One thing that is interesting is, depending on how you look at it, you actually have states, and in particular governors and legislative bodies drawn from both parties, that have made some really tough choices over the last few years, that have quite frankly done more to drive down federal mandatory spending than anything that Congress can wrap its heads around so far. You know, to give you a specific example, the governor of Oregon, who was here in town for the National Governors Association event, uh, was on C-SPAN talking about his the waiver that his state's uh, Medicaid program had received from um, CMS 
uh, to move wholesale populations over to managed care and that it would save seven billion dollars in combined state and federal spending over five years. That's also uh, very much in line with uh, changes that Andrew Cuomo's made in his Medicaid program in New York, which are projected to save about $34 billion over the next five years. And you've got similar requests and efforts to move patient populations to manage care and to make other changes that have achieved massive cost savings. If you were to look at the Arizona Medicaid program itself, where the state has made extremely tough choices, you know, denying transplant services to uh, some critically ill patients. You know, those are tough choices as a gov or as a legislator to look at a constituents in, uh, in, in the eye on. But they've made those kind of choices and managed care decisions. And their per patient cost right now is the same as it was in 2006. You'd be hard pressed to find any medical care system in America that's achieved that kind of cost containment. And all of those decisions, whether it's Oregon or New York or whether it's Jan Brewer in, in Arizona, all of them redound to the federal budget's benefit. Uh, you know, frankly, states are making hard choices, looking their constituents in the eye, and making program changes that a lot of the advocate community, community including perhaps CBPP, might have concerns with, but ultimately they're doing it because of their own fiscal concerns, uh, but ultimately saving money for the federal government. Uh, do you think that there's a way, do either of you think that there's a way that the federal government can work with states, particularly in Medicaid program management, to save money both for the feds and the states? Go ahead, Michael. I'm going to let uh, Debbie okay. handle that one. Yeah, well, you know, listen, states have to balance their budgets, so they do a lot of these things because, you know, they have to. I think there, there is an opportunity um, broadly for, you know, HHS and CMS to work with states on, you know, on waivers, on these other things. Um, and I think that that will actually work itself out. So, I, you know, I think from our perspective, you know, we would like to see, you know, ideally kind of what happens when the ACA is fully implemented. You know, there have CBOs already looked at some of the numbers. There have been some savings on both the Medicare and the Medicaid side um, already. You know, you, reasonable people can disagree, and, you know, we don't know for sure how much of it is, you know, as a res, you know, straight a result of the ACA or not. Um, but that's what the states are doing. And so our concerns, again, are kind of in addition to that, you know, what happens if, you know, the federal government steps in and says, okay, now we're going to do this big package of deficit reduction, either separately or uh, as a replacement for sequestration, and they kind of got Medicaid. What does that do to your state budget and to your economies? So I think there is an opportunity, you know, you know, with, with the federal agencies like HHS to work with states, you know, to try to figure some of these things out. Um, you know, the verdict is still out on, on you know, managed care, um, whether the savings actually materialize or not. I mean, CBO um, is not necessarily going to score some of these savings. It's worked in some states and not in others. It depends on, you know, whether the state already has a, a robust Medicaid program. And so um, I think our risks really, you know, kind of are more with the structural changes to the program in addition to the tough decisions that governors and legislatures have had to make um, that would really exacerbate some of the issues, you know. And this is all, you know, also with an eye to the economy, right? You don't want to cut too quickly. The reality is, well, you know, discretionary spending is being cut. You know, it is undermining the economy to the tune um, of 750,000 jobs on an annualized basis. So, you know, there, there's a lot of moving parts here. You know, you want to improve health care. You want to slow the cost. You want to protect the economy and you don't want to shift costs of states both on the Medicaid and the non-defense discretionary side. Anything to add, Ted? Uh, it's real simple. The federal government can borrow trillions of dollars and the states can't. I mean, that's, that's really what it comes down to. So, yeah, there's a little bit more of an incentive at the state level to uh, pay attention to the bottom line. No, I think it's interesting. The, uh, there are some estimates that if every state adopted the models of what Oregon and New York have done and other states that have just contained the cost of their per patient growth, like Arizona, that you could save a trillion dollars in federal spending over, over a decade, which is kind of the number we're talking about in sequestration. Obviously, getting there is horrifically difficult. And what's tough is those kind of savings, when a state goes out and saves that kind of money, um, 
it's hard to score that. You know, in terms of the uh, of CBO action, it's unless you put a hard per patient cap for the entire nation, which is something that gets proposed from time to time. But in the end, states are exercising political courage, where I would say the federal government isn't. Uh, but we have a specific question for CDPP, which is um, with regard to the economic impact for non-defense discretionary, uh, particularly I think it's that 75% wedge on your slide, Michael. Um, we have focused a lot on the amount of grant funding that's flowing into the states, um, hence the slides I had from federal funds information for states. But do you have a sense of the state-by-state -state impact in jobs and lost economic activity for those other non-defense expenditures that aren't in the grant space where states are receiving the money, but you know, going to the, the national labs or any of the other things going on in, in the non-defense side? You know, we, that we don't. Um, and maybe Devi could, uh, has looked at the CBO numbers a little bit more to know what their estimates of the, you mentioned the $750,000 for 750,000 jobs. Uh, have you, is, yeah, have you breaking that out? I mean, I haven't really taken a look at the actual model. Um, but I think, you know, in general, they tend to look at very macro models as opposed to trying to right. say, you know, you know, this amount of money is going to cause this amount of job loss. You know, in the, this local economy or in this state, there's multipliers. It's, it's very complicated. But as far as I know, um, you know, there's no, you know, state-by-state -state impact out there that people feel very comfortable with or that some people wouldn't take issue with. I haven't seen anything. You're talking about the, the federal programs under NDD, the FBI, border enforcement. Yeah, I, I assume, based on the question, I assume that it, you know, there's all that um, information being circulated in terms of lost defense jobs. Yeah. And certainly the White House put out its piece kind of uh, providing job totals tied to some of the other aspects of sequestration, and a lot of that has been very controversial. Um, in fact, we at CSG, we rely on the Federal Funds Information Service figures as the, the source and uh, let let states themselves figure out what those cuts will uh, will uh, how how they'll play out in terms of impact on local education and things like that. But I have not I have not seen any comprehensive information on uh, on you know the, the same level of detail on lost jobs and economic activity on the non-defense side outside of state grants that you do on the defense side. Yeah, I haven't either. There's been some coverage just in the last couple of days of the cuts to the impact aid program, which is education funding that goes to schools on military bases and and uh, and and uh, Native American reservations, um, and that those funding cuts are hitting hitting in the very near term, and in those very local communities will have a a pretty significant impact, um, but. No, I haven't either seen seen anything comprehensive like what you're you're hoping for. Sure. Uh, well, another question we have just is in terms of what kind of looking into the crystal ball for both uh, uh, both you, Michael, and Tad. Um, it's been about a six percent cut that states have endured uh, in grant funding uh, so far, uh, based on the sequestration cuts and. Of course, that's on top of other things from the Budget Control Act. But uh, looking out to the future, um, and Michael, you mentioned that that you know certainly sequestration and the distribution of cuts is just for this fiscal year. It's up to Congress to do what whatever they want in appropriating under the caps in the future. But if you were to guess what the actual um, funding level cuts in this state federal fiscal relationship will be in two years' time or three years' time, and you too, Tad, you know, put yourself back in your role of being a state budget officer, and you were thinking about planning for the governor's budget a couple years from now. Is it 6%? Is it 8%? Is it 15%? Uh, do you have a number in your head that seems to make sense to you, given the state of play right now? So I would just reiterate. I don't have a number in my head. I go ahead, Tad. Go ahead. <laughs> no, that's all right. Go ahead. You go first. I'll go last. Okay. Um, well, you know, it's it's. I mean, we don't know, right? But it does seem very likely that 
um, as Congress, uh, that it seems very likely, it seems inevitable that the BCA, the Budget Control Act cuts of 2011, are 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 going to stick. They're and and and, and uh, we don't know exactly what's going to happen with the sequestration cuts. Um, we don't know what's going to happen with broader deficit reduction, but we know we're getting uh, the Budget Control Act caps. And as Congress thinks about how to appropriate those caps in the, in the future, um, and any additional cuts that come through sequestration or or uh, additional deficit reduction, as I said, when when they look at the pot that is uh, non-defense discretionary or discretionary funding generally, they look at defense programs and then they look at these federal programs like the like border enforcement, like food safety, like medical research, the FBI, and it's just hard to believe that Congress is going to um, cut those sorts of things more than aid to states and localities. So I really suspect that. Um, you know, we, we try to give states a sense of what's coming just by looking at a, at, by breaking out those cuts, assuming that they are proportional, that the cuts to state and local aid are proportional to all the cuts to, to NDD. But it, it seems more likely to us, substantially more likely to us, that, uh, that they'll actually be deeper than just, the purport, the, than just that proportional cut. And you know, if you extend that to, as I said, if you extend that to that argument to further cuts in sequestration or additional cuts to discretionary spending that come through uh, additional federal deficit reduction, then you know you're you're looking at very sizable reductions. We already are, but even deeper reductions in in uh, in federal funding for these things that states and local governments do. Well, well thanks. And how about you, Ted? I think you gave a very helpful figure on the front end, which was that historical average of state uh, spending that was from the federal government. You know, going back to 2000, 25 percent or so, we're still substantially higher than that at close to 31 uh, percent. Do you see us returning into that that historical average, or, or where, where do you think the future is heading? No, I, you know, I, I think it's going to be. And again, there's so many factors at play here. There's, you know, unanticipated events. Uh, the economy, what happens with the economy going forward has a lot to say about this. I think what happens with entitlement reform and tax reform has a lot to say with it. Uh, you know, perhaps uh, the more that politicians hone in on discretionary spending, that might result in more pressure to, to tackle mandatory spending uh, and entitlement programs. But uh, you know, I look at, again, I look at state government and local government as any other special interest. And they've gone from 25% up to 34%, now down to 31%. But they're addicted to money. They're used to getting that money. They, uh, and they ask for that money. They work for that money. And, uh, you know, the, the one thing I saw in state government is that the state government is minor leagues for the federal government. And what I mean by that is they go, a lot of these future politicians get their start at the lower level and they make connections and they work their way up. And, and really when it comes down to the whole federal state relationship in terms of grants and, and subsidies and stuff, it, it's rather nonpartisan. Uh, and I certainly saw that with Mitch Daniels. And so uh, again, so I think as long as the federal government can spend money on education uh, and all these other things that I would frankly prefer state and local government handle, they're going to continue to do so. The numbers are going to change depending on economic circumstances and depending on what happens with taxes and entitlement reform. But I think the big picture here doesn't change. Uh, to me, I say that's unfortunate, but being realistic, I think that's the way it's going to go. Well, I think we're going to leave it um, at that. Um, I appreciate both of our panelists. And uh, you, you you have very different uh, views on this. I mean, from our side at the Council of State Governments, the one thing I will say is we don't view states as a special interest. We, we view them as, uh, as the, the bedrock of our country, and they're mentioned in the Constitution. But, uh, but I, and I certainly think that we're at a moment where 
much of the political courage necessary to deal with our, our national fiscal problem is being outsourced by default down to the state level. Uh, that yes, we have, have states that have uh, that make their own bad financial decisions. That's for sure. And yes, we have a uh, a situation where where some of the kind of balance sheet issues of states are ultimately put onto the federal balance sheet. That, that the Recovery Act took a big chunk of the cumulative state fiscal deficit and put it on the federal balance sheet. It's still sitting there. Uh, so to that extent, the, the states are, are, are part of this national fiscal problem that we have. They are recipients for federal funds. But every dollar that they put into matching funds for all of those major 42 uh, federal, uh, federal state partnership accounts are extremely hard fought. And I think for a governor like Jan Brewer who uh, signed on to a tax increase, or governors across the political spectrum who had to do that, go against their own party line in some cases, or cut Medicaid for a Democratic governor like Andrew Cuomo, I think that they're exercising a level of political courage that, that would be helpful to have our national, uh, national leaders exercise. Uh, so it's a pleasure working with states, and it's a pleasure to have everybody on the line who stayed throughout all of this. But I want to really thank Cato and CBPP both in that you both produce great data uh, that we utilize on, uh, on many occasions and that I see used in state capitals. And, uh, and uh, although we may not always be on the same page, I think just having organizations that, that dedicate this much analysis to what happens beyond the Beltway is, is a great benefit. So thank you both, uh, 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 Michael and Tad. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, my pleasure, Chris. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks again, everyone.